Well, we're going to be studying the book of Hebrews over the next few weeks, in fact months. There's 13 chapters, and if we were to study it all um, verse by verse, uh, it would take us at least till Christmas, if not beyond. So we're not going to do that. Um, we did study Peter, First Peter, um, uh, in, in that way. But I'm going to take passages out of Hebrews as we go through the whole book. And, uh, and uh, as I said, I'm going to give you notes um, each time we study it. In fact, I have them here for tonight. It's kind of a binder that you can put the other notes in. But this, is, this contains um, all of what I'm going to say tonight. And tonight's a way of introduction, really, to the book of Hebrews. Um, and, and, and as I studied it, I became aware that the book of Hebrews was written... And we'll talk a bit about this uh, in a moment as well, in more detail. But it was written when things were changing in the first century world, especially in the world of, of, of Christianity. And, and, and it seemed like uh, everything at that time in that society, in that culture, was being shaken. And, and uh, the, the stability of what, what, what the first Christians had, had depended on and... and, and and, and knew about was 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 being shaken, and uh, because of that, for some of them, not all of them, but for for some of them, their faith was wavering. Now we looked at First Peter, and we studied that, and saw that, that was written to strengthen the faith of those who had been persecuted, and were scattered abroad. And the Book of Hebrews is also written to try to, to sort of strengthen uh, the faith of Christians, and we'll get into that as as we go. Um, the key verse, if you want to just go to this first of all, is Hebrews chapter 5. If uh, you can find it, Hebrews chapter 5, 5th chapter into the 13th, and uh, verses 12 through 14. Uh, and this is sort of the key passage that, that uh, everything else that's written really uh, has reference to this. Uh, and the writer says... Uh, uh, by this time, you ought to be teachers. If you need someone else to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again, you need milk, not solid food. And everyone who lives on milk is still an infant, not, not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And so they had, in those days even, uh, problems distinguishing good from evil and some were getting carried away with strange teaching and strange doctrine and all sorts of stuff and uh, so the writer to <coughs> Hebrews is, is reminding them uh, especially those that were beginning to falter you know that uh, you really need to uh, go on to maturity basically he, he's saying here and, and it's, it's a little bit like what Paul uh, writes about in, uh, in Ephesians in, in, in chapter 4, I'll just read it to you. In chapter 4 and verse, verses 14 and 15, Paul said something similar to the early church in Galatia. He said, uh, then we will no longer, uh, well, he, he says in verse 13, till we all reach the unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up unto him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, uh, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So you can see from what Paul said and what the writer of the Hebrews was saying, um, there was this concern um, in the early days of the church. And, you know, I've said it before, a lot of people have this hankering to go back to the first century, to be like the Acts of the Apostles. Let's get back to be like the Acts of the Apostles. Well, it was, it was no different then as it is now. Uh, there were difficulties, and, and, and people were being tested in their faith, and, and so on. So, um, that being said... Um, the, uh, you'll see in the, in the notes I'm going to give you there's a little timeline um, uh, for when the book was written and, uh, and interestingly I didn't know this until I studied it um, it was written 
um, after First Peter <coughs> had been written. Uh, so we're sort of following on with the same sort of theme in some ways. Uh, and uh, you'll see that little timeline there from Paul's first missionary journey right, right through and various things that happened. Um, now, the book of Hebrews, um, apart from <coughs> telling us who should make the tea, um, Hebrews, not Hebrews. Hebrews is a good cup. Huh? Yes. Hebrews is a good cup. But it, I'm, I'm taking a kind of an overview tonight, a little introduction of the big picture, if you like. But it really tells us, it proves that we can never fully understand the Old Testament without the New Testament, or the New Testament without the Old Testament. They complement each other. Uh, and, and as I said, it was written, the book of Hebrews was written to strengthen the faith of first century Christian believers. In fact, some commentators would call it the fifth gospel. The fifth gospel. The first four, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. <coughs> that is the bed that I lie on. But those four gospels were about Christ's ministry on earth. <coughs> For us Hebrews, some have said it was the fifth gospel, describes Christ's ministry in heaven. Uh, and uh, as we understand that, as we go along understanding that, uh, we'll see that, that, that that thought and that truth in itself should strengthen us, no matter what we're dealing with or going through. When we know that, that we have a high priest uh, in heaven who, 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 who is praying for us, and so on. And so it was written specifically to Hebrew Christians, to Jewish Christians, Probably in Jerusalem, uh, written to the church in Jerusalem, um, uh, to try and uh, you know avert this danger that some of them had or seemed to have had of drifting back into Judaism. They'd come out of Judaism and they'd become a Christian. They come out of the law and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. But there was uh, apparently a temptation for various reasons for some of them to go back on their faith and and. Uh, they're, they're exhorted to let go of everything else in order to hold fast to, to the hope of the gospel. Uh, and uh, there's no, no other document, no biblical document outside of the four gospels that focuses as totally and as, as, as forcibly on, on the person of Jesus Christ and his, his uh, redemptive work. And we'll see that as we, we study it in various, various ways. Um, and if there's a, an unfamiliarity with the epistle of the Hebrews, uh, as there are, uh, and as I was unfamiliar, uh, it's because, um, I think it's because many, many people, many Christians, especially today, seem to settle uh, for, for a very simple understanding and a superficial association with the Christian faith. A lot of Christians, it seems to me, and this is the judgment I'm making, but this letter will talk about the judgment seat of Christ um, later on. But um, it seems to me that a lot of Christians are not prepared for whatever reason to go on to maturity, like the writer of the Hebrews encourages us to do. And they settle for something that's, that's less than, 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 than what, they, what they should settle for. Uh, so it was to arouse these early Christians uh, from a kind of a lethargic state, a lazy state of compromise in some respects and complacency uh, and to sort of put a fire under them, to incite them uh, wholeheartedly uh, to, to lay hold of the Christian faith. Uh, and uh, that's why it was originally written. It's, it's like a tonic. It's like the old uh, bottle of Lucas Aid wrapped in cellophane that used to bring up to the hospital. Uh, years ago, a little tonic uh, for the spiritually debilitated. Um, and, and, you know, if, if we haven't really studied the book of Hebrews or, or looked at it very much for ourselves, we, we, that's to our own detriment, really, because there's so much, so much that God has to say to us in the book of Hebrews. And so, I believe the study, a study that we're going to embark on might be the next step uh, for us as a church, as we seek to, 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 to grow in our desire for a greater relationship, greater intimacy 
with Jesus Christ. Greater faith, bolder acts of service uh, in the weeks and months and uh, God knows the years to come. I think it can motivate us as the study of the book of Hebrews. And on Sunday I'm going to reference that uh, very briefly in, in announcements and I'll have some of these notes uh, for people who aren't here tonight and try to encourage people uh, to come out uh, as we go through this study of the book of Hebrews. Uh, and more than any other uh, New Testament book, Hebrews connects the dots. Do you remember those puzzles? Maybe some of you still do them, okay. connecting the dots. Um, uh, but it connects the dots between the Old Testament and the New Testament um, and helps us understand the relationship between Jewish and Gentile believers uh, and, and also uh, the relationship between Israel um, uh, as God had called them out and the church as we know it today. Uh, but above all, it exalts the person uh, and the work of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and it, it exhorts it and it, it encourages <coughs> us to draw near to him in every respect. Um, and it provides us with uh, the most extensive uh, um, study of the, the high priestly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, because he's known as you know, a prophet, priest and king. And, and, and uh, uh, we don't dwell much on his priestly ministry, especially that which is now, where he's seated on the right hand of the Father and he's, and he's interceding on our behalf. He's our heavenly priest. Um, we read about what's called the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17, just before um, you know the, the events of, of uh, Good Friday and, and all of that unfolded when he met with his disciples for, the, for sort of the last time. And uh, uh, we find references to his, his ministry as a priest in other areas of the New Testament, but it's the book of Hebrews that gives us the fullest expression of his ministry as a great high priest. And we'll see that as we, as we continue to, 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 to study it. And, and it's, that, it's that truth that we have in Jesus, someone who's alive today, who's our high priest, who's interceding for us, really that, uh, that's, that's something that we need to lay hold to when we're going through difficult times, that he's there. He hasn't abandoned us. He hasn't left us alone, you know. And and and, and Hebrews emphasizes that. Um, and it also, as we'll see, it emphasizes the authority of the Word of God, and it urges us to to heed, and to obey, uh, and to heed its warnings and so on. And and, and it challenges us, as as we'll see, because um, some great chapters here that challenge us to live by faith. <coughs> uh, and, and, and provides many practical examples of, of, of how that's to be done and can be done. And, and there's a great chapters 10, 11, 12, the, 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 the uh, heroes of the faith are listed there for us. Um, so there's many, many, many encouragements, but it has some sobering words <coughs> of warning for us as well as Christians uh, who would ignore or reject or disregard God's word and 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 draw back from from going on uh, uh, to maturity uh, as as it uh, as it uh, uh, references uh, in several places um, because the writer to the Hebrews these first century Jewish Christians who had converted to Christianity from Judaism the writer will not will not tolerate in the way that he writes this. Or hear of us living lives of complacency, lives that neglect God's word and, 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 and intimacy with Christ and fellowship with his people. And, and, and the writer urges us to press on and, and warns us of the dangers of not, not doing that and settling, settling for a comfortable, uh, less sacrificial experience of our faith. And uh, challenges us, as said, to go deeper uh, into our spiritual understanding of, 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 uh, of our faith uh, and, 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 and in order to help us to endure and to persevere especially as tougher days come upon us and, and I believe they will be. Uh, we talk about the persecution of the early church well there's persecution happening today uh, thank God we don't we don't suffer from that but 
who knows what's around the corner for any of us in these days. And so tonight as we begin this study, uh, I, I can tell you it's one of the most exciting and one of the most challenging uh, books in the Bible. Um, there are those that would say the two most important books in the New Testament are the book of Romans and the book of Hebrews. And Romans is a book of, of deep, deep theology, Bible teaching about the work of Jesus Christ. Hebrews is a book that tells us all about the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, 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 uh, and so they're both equally important but for different reasons. Uh, and as I said, the teachings of this book are designed to uh, push us on uh, when we're tempted to either stop or slow down or, or even go back. Um, and and, and the, the goal of this letter, this epistle, really is to teach people to, to love Jesus more and acknowledge his lordship in their lives um, and, and, and so on. Um, so there's, there's deep spiritual teaching that we'll come to uh, and we're told to abide in, in those truths that we'll lead, uh, that we'll, 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 we'll come to. Um, it's not a light book, it's not a, an easy reading book and I would encourage you just to, to read it over the next little while for yourself uh, and we'll need to depend very heavily and I say this with a degree of humility but we'll need to depend, all of us, myself included, uh, on, 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 on depending heavily on the Holy Spirit uh, to open up the teaching of this, this book to our hearts. Um, because there's no other book in the Bible, like I said, that pulls together the teaching of the Old and the New, New Testament. And uh, it, it brings a unity to the 66 books of the, of the Bible uh, because they all... All those books, at the end of the day, they all come from the same author. It may have the name of John or Isaiah or Peter or Mark or, or Joshua. But the same author is who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That's right, the Holy Spirit. Um, and Hebrew shows us that the truths of the New Testament have been hidden in the Old Testament. Um, and the Old Testament uh, is made plain in the New Testament. Uh, I think St. Augustine, one of the first century uh, renowned uh, Christians, said the new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. So who wrote the book of Hebrews? Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Paul. Paul. Paul, Paul get the most votes? Any other takers? Well, it says Paul yeah. Huh? <laughs> Does it? Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't say that in mine. It, it just says Hebrews. It says it here. That's the King James, is it? Yeah. Well, it's the Paul the Apostle. To the well, there's, 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 there's no... Um, nowhere in Hebrews are we told, in the canon of Scripture, who wrote the book. Now, there, there are those who have studied the the way it's written, the things that are written down and, and, and compared them to Paul and have come to the conclusion that it must have been Paul. Um, uh, but others have said that it could have been Luke or it could have been Silas or Barnabas or Apollos or Aquila or Timothy. Um, no one, even the King James, authorized version, 16, whatever, uh, can dogmatically say who the authorship of Hebrews was. Like Origen, an early, another early Christian teacher said, who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews? Only God knows. Mm -hmm. I think that's all we can say too. But whoever was the human author, and we're not told, we do know that the divine author was the Holy Spirit. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe it was probably by des divine design that the author of Hebrews left off his name, didn't write his name, because it was designed and designated to exalt the glories of Christ. And the author wanted men to see Christ and not think about him. And I think that's, 
that's reason, reasonable to assume. Um, but having said that, the author constantly refers, as we'll see, to the Old Testament, quotes the law, quotes from the Psalms, quotes from the prophets, uh, more than any other New Testament book. So whoever, whoever the author was, uh, he has to be respected in history as one of the great <coughs> expositors of Scripture because of his knowledge of the Old Testament as well, uh, as we'll see. So that's all we can say about who, who wrote the uh, book of Hebrews. When was it written? Um, just as a little passing thought, apparently it can be fixed sometime before AD 70, um, 70 years after the death of Christ, because the temple, the temple was still standing and sacrifices were still being made in the temple and Christ is said to have ascended to the right hand of the Father. So the date would seem to be sometime between you know, the death of Christ, 33 AD if you like, and 70 AD when, when Jerusalem was, was destroyed. Uh, and, and because the temple was still in existence and, and all the ceremonial stuff was still happen, happening, there was this temptation by some of these converted Hebrew Christians to go back to the ceremonial sort of stuff and, 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 and renege on their faith in Jesus Christ. Well, the theme, the underlying theme of Hebrews, we've kind of mentioned it a few times, is, is the exalted Christ. Uh, the God-man who's been exalted through his resurrection, sits on the right hand of the Father as our great high priest, constantly interceding. And, and four times uh, in Hebrews, Christ is mentioned as sitting on his throne in heaven. And you'll get that in your notes in chapter 1, chapter 8, chapter 10, chapter 12. Uh, referred to four times. And so it's important to, uh, it's an important truth for us even today, 2,000 years on, to remember he's still there. He hasn't gone away. Uh, as that uh, expression, well, known expression is he hasn't gone away, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, as we read through the book of Hebrews, and we'll start that next week. Um, our thoughts are constantly being turned towards Jesus. Uh, and, and, and when we're finished reading it or studying it, we can say with the author, as he himself says in chapter 2 and verse 9, but we see Jesus. Hopefully <clears throat> we'll be able to say that. And God has spoken through Jesus. He tells us that right at the top, at the beginning of the first chapter um, and therefore real Christianity is a relationship with a person, it's not about a works type of religion um, uh, we're told uh, in this epistle that because Christ is exalted he's superior uh, to the Old Testament prophets, he's superior to the angels, he's superior over Moses, superior over Joseph or, or Joshua superior over each and all of the Old Testament saints and the writer tells us that over and over again. And so let's just take a look for a few moments about uh, who, 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 who was the writer, whoever it was, writing this to, this letter, going out to the <coughs> church in Jerusalem, to these Jewish Christians. Who, who, who were they? Well, um, this group that this letter was addressed to uh, either lived in Jerusalem itself uh, or in the general...